All right, good afternoon and hello everyone. Welcome to another installment of the LRD webinar series. My name is Tricia Clark. I am the Community College Engagement Librarian. Um, today, my colleague Glenn will be discussing going beyond the first page of your research results. Um, today's session will be recorded and will be shared on our YouTube page a little bit later on, possibly today, maybe tomorrow. Um, if you are pre-registered for this webinar, you will receive an email with a link to the recording. Um, if you have any questions, please feel free to use the Q&A uh, section here in Zoom. Um, we'll get to them primarily at the end, but if there's something pressing during the presentation, we can take a look at those as well. All right, and now I will turn it over to Glenn. All right, uh, thank you, Tricia. Um, I am uh, Glenn J. Benedict. I'm the Access Services Librarian uh, here at uh, the UDC uh, Library. And today we're going to discuss uh, going beyond the first page. Um, so. Yeah, so welcome, everyone. Um, so when we're talking about going beyond the first page of your search results, um, I want to talk first about just sort of some uh, sort of what research has shown us about the search habits of people as they um, uh, are doing searches, and it could be either in Google or in academic databases. And we'll kind of I'll kind of kind of go over some different reasons why you're going to want to go beyond your first page of search results both when dealing with Google and other uh, sort of commercial um, web search engines, and then also when you're in the academic databases and sort of a little bit of the differences between the two. Um, so some factors uh, that influence user behavior uh, when they're on search result pages. So, you know, a study, um, this was from an article by um, a couple authors who did a sort of uh, a literature uh, survey of what research had been done in what uh, and how sort of users when they're doing their searches uh, how they behave when they're on these search result pages and they came basically came up with three sort of key factors that influence sort of out of those search results what gets clicked what doesn't the first is that the position the most important thing is that users spend the majority of their clicks on the first few search results uh, another thing is that users choose links that are immediately visible, i.e. that they can see without scrolling. And finally, uh, users are more attracted to links that are larger or have a graphical component. So an important thing to note here is that none of these factors mention anything about uh, the credibility of the source where the information is coming from. It doesn't say anything about um, you know how timely the information is about uh, how relevant the search may be um, what are the credentials of the uh, of those of uh, the um, of where this information is coming from. So again, these are sort of three factors that are influencing user behavior. But again, none of them are really focusing on the quality of the information that is being presented. Um, so I just wanted people you to keep these sort of three factors in mind as we go on and discuss more detail, especially when we're talking about the, the commercial search engines like Google. Um, so that's what we're going to assess first is uh, Google and other search engines. I'm going to be primarily focused on Google as Google handles the sort of vast majority of web searches that are done worldwide. Um, but I do want to point out that almost nothing that, um, you know, there are things, there are problems with Google that are unique to Google, and there are some problems that are sort of uh, universal among search engines. Um, and so we'll talk a little bit about that. So the first uh, thing we want to talk about is what is a search engine? Um, so what a search engine is, is that it is a piece of software that scours the World Wide Web for information 
in response to a query, i.e. a search. Um, so what it does is it, uh, it searches. Uh, the way that it takes this in the information um, that it finds and presents it to the user, uh, it, that is entirely governed by what's called an algorithm. Uh, an algorithm is a finite sequence of instructions that can be used for making decisions or performing calculations. Um, so if you're familiar with things like a, uh, you know, like a decision tree, you know, uh, you know, you have a first question and you sort of do all the steps in order until you answer the first question might be yes or no. And then based on your answer to that question, it takes you to a different question where you have a yes or no. That's, you know, that is a, that's a type of algorithm. Um, and so what's important is that the, the algorithm is a tool, right? It is not, uh, there is not a person at Google who is giving you this information in response to a search. Um, uh, unlike you would have with, say, if you were doing a uh, consultation with a librarian, um, there's no one that is curating, directly curating uh, the information that is being presented back to you, but it is being the information, um, not only what gets um, presented at the end of the search, but what order things are presented in, what gets priorities, um, what web pages are visible, what aren't, uh, those are made um, both, but those decisions are made both by the algorithm and then also by people who work at the, uh, the search engine, uh, either by making specific rules in the algorithm or by making tweaks that may have unintended consequences in the algorithm. Um, and something that you'll probably see a lot, you may have seen a lot, is something called SEO, which is search engine optimization. And because algorithms are what is determining how, uh, like I said, what information is being presented to the person who is doing the searches, there are ways that you can manipulate the algorithm into giving your web pages, which might be a business, it might be um, a piece of propaganda, it might be an advertisement, um, and, you know, it might be an opinion, uh, ways that you can make your content more visible uh, uh, to the algorithm, which then makes it more visible to users as they're doing their searches. Um, and so if you remember how uh, those, you know, the, the uh, behaviors of users when they're doing their searches, it is very important then if you are trying to advertise or if you are, again, are trying to do any kind of outreach to users who are doing searches on certain topics that your, um, uh, your web pages come up, uh, you know, first on Google's first page of search results that they're immediately visible and that um, there is some sort of design component because then, you know, the more uh, clicks you get on your link, the better a chance you have of influencing the user's behavior in some way, whether it be to um, sell them a product or a service or to convince them to uh, believe or to vote uh, um, in a certain way. Uh, that's all search engine optimization. And again, none of these techniques um, say anything about the quality of the information that is on the website, how reliable, how up-to-date, um, how valid. None of that really, um, it does in some ways, you know, there may be points in the algorithm where that uh, type of information, where some of that information is prioritized over others. But again, it, you can manipulate search results. Um, and there's a whole biz side, you know, there's a whole industry around SEO, because um, if you want your goods or services uh, to be more visible to users, you know, there are whole, uh, you know, like I said, there's a whole industry devoted to, uh, showing, to showing you how you can do that. Uh, so a key 
thing to that we sh should be thinking about when we think about how much this algorithm has control over what we see, um, what information is presented to us online, is that algorithms aren't neutral. And they sound like they are. Again, this is, you know, this is a, you know, it's a piece of computer code. It's a program that is running. Um, but algorithms are tools. They're created by people. And people have biases. They have conscious biases. And they have unconscious biases. And therefore, the products that they make share those biases. Um, so scholar uh, Sophia Moja Noble, uh, in her book, Algorithms of Oppression, uh, describes how Google and other search engines reflect a culture where, uh, for example, whiteness is seen as a default. And I'm sure many people have seen examples of this. I know um, every year, every couple of years or so, there's a, um, uh, you know, there's a Twitter story that'll go viral because uh, a user will do a search and notice that, hmm, when this, when I search for, in uh, an example, uh, three black teenagers, uh, this Twitter user got back in the Google images, uh, shots of mugsh of uh, uh, teenage black um, young men uh, and mugshots or other sort of um, uh, photos which indicated uh, of you know three young men who were uh, involved with the police or the justice system in some way. Whereas if you did uh, a search for three white teenagers, Google was giving out um, sort of these generic wholesome stock photos. Um, and uh, one of the big things in algorithms of oppression and sort of one of the key things that um, uh, started um, uh, Noble's research into this is just, this was uh, roughly 20, 2009, 2010, uh, a search for the, for the word, uh, for the phrase black girls. The first page of Google results was something like, the vast majority of the results that were being returned for that search were extremely pornographic um, and full of extremely degrading and um, dehumanizing terms used to describe Black women in a sex worker context. Whereas if, you know, with, um, and then uh, in the book, there's um, images of search results for similar terms, uh, you know, uh, Latino women, Hispanic, or sorry, Latina girls, uh, Hispanic girls, white girls, um, and sort of just the discrepancy in terms of what content was being, uh, you know, being produced by the algorithm in terms of for very similar searches. Um, but the assumption that the algorithm was making is that if you're searching this one term, there is a certain type of content that you were looking for where it, or who the default searcher is. You know, if, if a default searcher is searching this term, uh, one term, they are searching for one type of content. But if that same assumed default user is searching a slightly different term, in one case, you know, uh, three black teenagers or three white teenagers, black girls, white girls, you are getting two different sets of content uh, based on what the algorithm assumes, who the algorithm assumes the default user is. Um, and so you, you'll see these sort of stories pop up um, every couple of years. Uh, Google is always sort of apologetic about, you know, uh, when these things happen. They take steps. Uh, usually, the algorithm gets updated pretty quickly um, to, to to give a different uh, result. Uh, to which um, uh, Professor Noble then responds. So the question is, why, if this, if the change to the algorithm could be made so quickly, why wasn't it made much earlier? Um, so that is just something to think about. In um, and obviously, you know. Uh, Race is not the only factor. Uh, you know, sex, sexual orientation, um, all sorts of different vectors of marginalization uh, come go into uh, 
come into effect here. And it's very obvious uh, that the, the assumed default user of Google or other search engines um, is not necessarily ref of, of who they who Google assumes that this their user is is not reflective of the sort of broader user base. Um, so those are examples of sort of how uh, the algorithm, um, you know, sort of may prioritize or deprioritize some kinds of content. Uh, but also be aware that uh, Google and other search engines, there are times when they take active steps to uh, censor content, to give priority to other content. Um, so newspapers uh, in, from pretty much across the spectrum, so including The Guardian um, and The Wall Street Journal, uh, have done big uh, reports on how employees, contractors, politicians, and businesses can manipulate Google's algorithm. And not just the algorithm, but Google's uh, own internal policy to influence search results. Um, and again, this is a sort of a common news story that you'll see uh, quite a bit. Um, there is uh, sort of, com again, complaints from groups across the political spectrum. Um, groups on the far right, groups on the far left, uh, complaining that their content is being censored by Google. Um, and again, other, other search engines, other social media platforms in terms of what it is producing um, when, when users search. Uh, so it's another example, uh, YouTube, which is owned by Google. Uh, in 2017, uh, they updated uh, a new filtering system uh, and which resulted in, and this is Google's own words, hundreds of thousands of videos containing LGBTQ content that were mistakenly filtered by YouTube for quote, inappropriate content. Um, so again, when you are doing searches in Google, you always need to be aware of, think about what is being shown to me, what is not being shown to me. Um, do I need to go a little deeper? And sometimes on these on searches, going deeper might involve uh, doing a more sophisticated or more complex search string. Uh, like you might, uh, in our previous webinar, um, uh, a colleague of ours uh, talked about doing uh, big searches. Um, but another way of uh, doing this is to sort of, again, go beyond that first page. Um, and just as an example of uh, again, this is an image that comes directly from Google itself, where it shows you uh, on this image on the right of the screen here. It shows you an example of how Google search results differ from ads. And in the yellow uh, box labeled number one is um, where ads appear in a search. And two is where the search results start. Um, so, if, but remember what we talked about earlier with uh, how do people, what are people's um, habits where they're doing searches? Remember they're clicking on based on position, visibility and design. So if you notice the ads show up first, they are more visible. You know, you don't, you're not gonna have to scroll to get to, um, to get to them. And there is, um, in many cases, there's a visual component where there is a more interesting design element to the ads, which again is going to entice you to click. So be aware that um, beyond anything of ideology or uh, political bias or um, unconscious bias uh, based on, again, elements of marginalization, there is a financial consideration to what results Google shows you and many other search engines. Um, so again, all things to be thinking about when you're when you're doing uh, when you're doing searches, especially especially in Google, but in other uh, search engines as well. And so I also want to talk a little bit about um, academic databases. 
So there is, uh, you know, obviously there is some differences between why you would use an academic database versus when you would use Google or a search engine. Um, a, a key thing is that an academic search, uh, an academic database, um, all the content has in an academic database has been curated, right? So there is uh, the content that's in that database has already been selected based on a certain type of criteria. So it is, you know, journals. Uh, could be newspapers, could be archival material, but, um, and then also it depends on the, the purpose of the database. So some data of our academic databases are very broad and they cover a lot of different disciplines and a lot of different formats of, um, of content. And some are very specific. You know, they may be focused on one, uh, one part of an academic discipline and they may only, or they may only contain, uh, you know, one, you know, the, it's the full archives of one uh, newspaper, for example. So, but in all of those cases, all of those have, all the content has been selected for it pur um, purposefully. Unlike Google, which Google and all the other web pages, they're casting a very wide net. Um, so that is one area where these, these two things are separate. Um, uh, so another thing is that the important thing about academic databases when you're doing searches and why you might want to go beyond the first page when you're in an academic database is that uh, databases can only show you what's in the database. So that's, you know, it sounds obvious, but it's important to keep in mind. Um, another thing is if you are doing uh, research, you know, especially if you're a student, and um, be aware that a lot of these academic projects that you're working on, they're intended to be comprehensive. So you want a full spectrum of resources and sources to, um, to look at. You might not need to cite them all, you might not need to read everything in detail, but the assumption is, especially the higher up you go in academia, um, you know, whether you're an undergraduate, a graduate, PhD candidate, or, a, uh, or you're a professor who's working on a paper or a book, these projects that you're working on, again, they're intended that when you are, when you as a scholar are talking on a subject, you are expected to have done a broad amount of research on the subject. You need to look at, you know, what is everything that has been published on a certain topic? Um, and so with these, with those situations, it doesn't matter how, how big your search stream is, um, you know, or how specific or how much filtering you do, because you're supposed to look at everything. Um, so that, so in many of those cases, you have to go beyond the first page of results anyway, you know, you might, you might can be able to filter your results down to, you know, a hundred sources in a database, um, but it's still, you know, that's not all going to show up on the first page. So you'll need to go more in depth in the resources that are available to you. Um, and finally, another thing is that because uh, many of these academic databases feature uh, content that is aimed at a um, a number of different um, intended audience. Uh, this, so if a database has both newspapers, which have a very generally have a very broad intended audience, they might have popular magazines, which again is a very broad audience. They may have uh, academic journals or technical manuals, which are again the 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 audience there is much more focused, and there is a, an assumed familiarity with uh, jargon or subject specific language. Um, that are in those. So depending on what your project is, uh, because, um, so for example, if you are working on a project where you need to look at some very, uh, you need material that is aimed at a very broad audience. So if you're doing like, uh, for example, a project on advertising and you need to look at actual advertisements uh, that were published in magazines, you know, you're, you want to look at uh, resources that are, again, are very broad um, 
have a very broad intended audience. Sometimes you may eat a variety of these, but remember that it, it is hard to filter. There are some things you can do to filter um, results based on the intended audience. You can get uh, 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 peer reviewed only um, articles, or you can you know filter out newspapers. Um, but sometimes you may, because you can't filter out everything that you're not necessarily looking for, it is important that you go beyond the first page because you might get some of those items that you couldn't filter out. And so, and you'll need to be um, a little bit more rigorous uh, in terms of what you're doing, your, of how you're doing your research. Uh, so these are some of the sources that um, I cited. And again, I just, uh, you'll be able to go back in, um, and look at the video as uploaded on YouTube um, and uh, take a look at some of these citations uh, in more detail. I do really recommend going to the Wall Street Journal article, uh, the Grind, which uh, Grind uh, at all, and the Guardian article, which is the Salon and Levin article. Uh, those are both really good sort of in-depth looks at uh, sort of the way that uh, Google. Uh, and their uh, the algorithm and their contractors and just different ways that uh, search results are manipulated. Um, so I'm going to uh, open up for questions in just a minute, but I, before we do, I just want to uh, plug our um, other ways that you can get in touch with uh, UC librarians. Uh, we have our, our email is ask at udc.libanswers.com. We also have an online chat. Uh, we do uh, appointments, which can be in person or virtual. And we are um, usually available at uh, the reference desk uh, at the library as well. So uh, yeah, full screen mode and see if we have any questions. Thank you so much for that, Glenn. That's um, really great. I actually need that list of references. Um, I also want to quickly just throw in the chat our um, a link to feedback. We'd like to get your feedback on the webinar today. So if you can take some time to fill that out for us, that would be great. That's available in the chat. Um, we can also start recording if anyone has any questions that um, they would not like to be recorded. I can go oh, ahead okay. and do that. Yeah. Okay. 